Hello friends, hope all of you are doing well. Welcome back to Mains Answer Writing Basics program being conducted by Team India for IAS. This is Manjunath Mudol. In this video, we are going to discuss about UPSC Mains 2024 GS Paper 1 Part 2. So in the part 1, we have discussed question number 1 to 5. In the part 2, we are going to discuss about question number 6 to 10. Broadly, here we are analyzing the question and its demand, analyzing the question and its demand. Then we are going to discuss answer approach to the questions. Then what should be the content, what we can write in the answer. Along with the answer, along with the content, we are also discussing what we can add as a part of value addition so that we can increase our score like examples, diagrams, data facts and other things. This video will help you to understand the demand of the UPSC questions. Demand of the UPSC questions and uh, what should be the ideal content that should be written in the answers, including value addition part. So, it will also provide you framework in structuring answers as per the demand of the UPSC. So, this will help you in upcoming UPSC mains 2025 and also the topics that we are going to discuss are crucial for upcoming UPSC prelims 2025. The same questions can also be asked in upcoming KAS exam 2024 or 25, which is going to be reconducted and also it will help in KAS mains. Most of the times the KPSC, it picks the questions from the UPSC GS papers and uh, it uh, uses the same questions in KAS GS papers. So, coming to the question number 6, what is the phenomenon of cloud bursts? Explain. So, the question is directly asking about the cloud burst. It is a straightforward current affairs question. Why? Because cloud bursts are recently in use. From the last 5 to 6 years, every year cloud bursts are in use, either in Himalayan region or in Western Ghats region, the cloud bursts are in use. So, because of that, UPSC asked question on cloud burst. So, there were chances of UPSC asking cloud burst either in geography part or in disaster management part. So, this year it is it asked question in geography part of the GS1 paper. So, it is asking to explain the phenomenon of cloud burst. Since the directive word is explained, we have to address all dimensions of the cloud burst, that is, its definition. We have to define what is cloud burst, then we have to write the factors or causes that are responsible for the formation of cloud bursts and also we should briefly write in the flow chart in a flow chart fashion we should write the mechanism of the formation of cloud burst then we should talk about the impact of the cloud burst so these dimensions we should cover reason being the key directive word is explained so if the directive word is explained or discussed we should address all aspects so, since the question is for 10 marks and 150 words, we should write this uh, flow chart that is uh, mechanism of the formation of cloud burst part as precisely as possible. So, coming to the introduction. So, introduction in Bariburu, we should define the cloud burst. So, cloud burst is a sudden intense rainfall over a small geographical area in a very short time or in a very short period, typically resulting in flash floods. So, this is the generalistic statement. Coming to the technical statement, it is defined as a precipitation event in which more than 100 mm of rain falls within an hour over a small area, often measuring just few square kilometers. So, in a few square kilometers, uh, in a very short period of time, uh, say if within an hour, 100 mm of rainfall occurs. So, if that happens, then we can, we are going to call it as a cloud burst. So, after defining cloud burst, we should write about the causes for the formation of cloud burst. What are the various causes? So, the first one is orographic uplift. So, due to orographic uplift of the moisture, there is a rapidity in the formation of clouds and uh, there is an increase in frequency of the phenomenon of cloud bursts in regions like Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. So, that is the Himalayan part. And also the same thing happens in Western Ghat region, example Kerala and Kuru region. 
there we have witnessed the cloud bursts then the second second factor that is responsible is monsoon winds the monsoon winds in south asia they bring lot of moisture so this lot of moisture while experiencing orographic uplift undergo intense cloud formation and a sudden and intense precipitation then the third factor causative factor is temperature inversion temperature inversion means a warm layer of air it traps the cool air beneath it so if it is cool air it is a layer of cool air so this layer of cool air is trapped by an upper layer of warm air so this is called temperature inversion and this temperature inversion it prevents the dispersion of moisture laden clouds so what 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 it does so it prevents the moisture laden in the cool air what happens there are moisture laden clouds so these moisture laden clouds are prevented from the dispersion to move further upwards and side sideways so because of this what happens once this inversion is broken down when this inversion is broken down an intense rainfall happens so because of this intense rainfall the cloud burst also happens then the fourth causative factor is climate change so the both climate change and global warming so it is leading to more erratic and extreme weather events all over the world the higher temperature they increase the atmosphere's ability to hold more moisture which can result in more intense cloud burst so these are the four factors that are responsible for the formation of cloud burst now we will try to understand we will briefly study about the mechanism of the cloud burst so here we have given the schematic representation of the phenomenon of cloud burst in the first step what happens rapid uplift of moisture happens so this is orographic uplift of the moisture so after uplifting condensation and cloud formation happens at the higher elevations of the mountains around 10 to 15 kilometers in height from the mean sea level so this uh, the clouds that are that are going to form are cumulonimbus clouds which are typically the thunderstorm clouds then after formation of the clouds what happens in the third step in the normal rainfall the moisture the precipitation happens happens over an extended period of time over an uh, larger geographical area on the other hand in the cloud burst there is a inability to release moisture gradually so the moisture is released suddenly instantaneously in a very short period of time causing the around 100 mm of rainfall within an hour in a one hour because of this what happens flash flood creates and flash flood happens as we have witnessed in uttarakhand himachal pradesh and jammu and kashmir so then the last point is topography's role the mountainous regions are highly steep slope they have a steep slope and uh, the terrain is also steep so because of that what happens the formation of cloud is also rapid the formation of cloud is also rapid and if uh, rainfall is also rapid so also after rainfall the flash floods that happen that is also rapid so because of all these reasons the cloud burst are considered one of the natural disasters this is all about the mechanism of the cloud burst now we will discuss briefly about the impact of the cloud burst so what are the various impact of the cloud burst the first one is flash floods for this we can give example of kedarnath disaster in the year 2013 in uttarakhand then second impact is landslides we can give example like kerala floods kerala flash floods and uh, kurg kurg flash floods it caused landslides then damage to infrastructure and property example we can write about uttarakhand cloud burst 2000 13 then we can talk about loss of life then in the fifth point we can write about loss to agricultural produce and sixth point it is uh, harm to ecological it causes ecological damage so these are the impacts of the cloud bursts 
since we mentioned the impact of the cloudburst instead of writing conclusion we should write way forward what we can write in the way forward preventive measures and mitigation strategies uh, in order to overcome the disasters being caused by the cloudburst so for that we can write about early warning systems disaster preparedness then afforestation and soil soil conservation urban drainage systems so these all points we can write in the way forward so this is all about the question number 6 its approach structure and major points that we can write in the exam now we will discuss the question number 7 that is what is the concept of demographic winter is there is the world moving towards such a situation elaborate so the question is asking about demographic winter so we should explain the question has two parts in the first part we should explain what is demographic winter and it uh, we have we should write its features then in the second part we should talk about whether the world whether it is moving towards demographic winter or not if yes we have to write 2.2 to 3 points if no then we should write for that 2 to 3 points then we should write conclusion so the question has two parts in the first part we should write four points then in the second point part if it is yes 2 to 3 points if it is no 2 to 3 points then conclusion so this is the structure of the answer in addition to this we should also write the factors that are contributing to the demographic winter the question is for 10 marks and the word limit is 150 words coming to the answer approach in the introduction we should define what is demographic winter definition of demographic winter will be a good introduction so demographic winter it refers to the declining birth rates and increase in aging population that is increasing the population of elderly people in many countries around the world this phenomenon has a significant implications for economies healthcare system and social structures so this constitutes the definition of demographic winter after defining what is demographic winter For, then we should write about the key features of the demographic winter the first one is declining fertility rates that is fewer children being born per woman then the second feature is aging population it means a growing pop- growing proportion of population who, who are aged 65 and above the third key feature is negative population growth it means there are more deaths than the births over a period of time leading to a shrinking population then the fourth feature is economic and social challenges for example shrinking labor force increased strain on social security systems and reduced economic productivity it means there is there is a increase in the population of older people so in order to support the population of older people the government should come up with more social security systems as elderly people are not available for the labor force and there is a less number of youth people so there is a shrinkage in the labor force and also there is a decline in economic productivity so after writing key features then we should address the next part of the question is the world moving towards demographic winter so we have to say yes there are features of demographic winter being witnessed in developed countries and some emerging economies while other regions they continue to experience population growth so the world is facing demographic winter so for that we should give examples like in europe countries like italy germany and spain they are experiencing negative population growth due to declining birth rates and an aging population so italy's fertility rate has been consistently below 1.5 children per woman then we should give examples like east asia in the east asia what happening in countries like japan south korea and china they are facing severe demographic challenges japan it is one of the world's highest proportions of elderly people it has one of the world's highest elderly people and its population has been sinking since 2011 japan's population is shrinking since 2011 and south korea's fertility rate is among the lowest in the world and it is 0.8 children per woman the south korea's tfr total fertility rate it is 
then we can give also the example of russia russia is facing very low birth rates and high death rates and because of this the population of russia is also declining so coming to the factors that are responsible for the demographic winter we should also briefly talk about factors the first one is urbanization and industrialization in highly urbanized societies the cost of raising children is higher and the couples they tend to delay marriages and child bearing often resulting in fewer children so they focus on careers and education particularly among women so this has also contributed to the lower fertility rates then the second factor is changing family structure that is in many developed countries family structure has changed significantly there has been a rise in single person households cohabitation and delayed marriages all of which contribute to fewer children being born then the fourth a third reason is economic insecurity in some countries economic instability and uncertainty about the future discourages the people from having larger families for example the high cost of housing education and healthcare it is deterring couples from having more children then the fourth factor is cultural shifts that is attitude towards marriage family and children have changed in many societies in some cultures the desire for smaller families or even a remaining childless has become more common also we should briefly talk about countries which are not facing demographic winter for example the countries like sub saharan countries sub sub saharan african countries like nigeria ethiopia they are experiencing rapid population growth and also in south asia example india india is also experiencing rapid population growth and one more example is bangladesh after writing this we should also briefly mention the challenges of demographic winter the first one is economic stagnation for this we can quote example of countries like japan then the second challenge is provision pension and healthcare crisis as the aging people or old age people increases the government should be ready to pay more pension and also it has to take uh, policies and measures which addresses the needs of the elderly people so it creates a pension and healthcare crisis then the third challenge is labor shortage due to decline in the youth people or young age people there is a shortage of labor example south korea and japan so after writing challenges we should write way forward so instead of writing conclusion we should write way forward to address the demographic dividend so first we should uh, talk about pro natalist policies then second we should mention about encouraging immigration in the third point we should talk about pension sector reforms and in the fourth point we should talk about technological and productivity improvements so this is all about uh, answer approach to the question number 7 its structure framework and uh, major dimensions that we are supposed to address now we will discuss question number 8 distinguish between gender equality gender equity and women's empowerment why is it important to take gender concerns into account in program design and implementation so the question has two parts in the first part it is asking to distinguish between concepts like gender equality gender equity and women's empowerment and in the second part it is asking why the program design and policy makers while designing and implementation of the policies they should take the gender concerns into account so in the first part we should define the concept and we should give the examples and for the second part we should write four to five points then conclusion this first part distinguish between gender equality gender equity and women empowerment it should be written in tabular format in the tabular format presentation way which is more effective so it is easy to compare the different concepts and their features and examples so we have to begin our answer by writing an introduction so in the introduction what we are supposed to write we should put any report like landsent report which talks about gender inequality we should quote any data related to gender inequality or we should also talk about we should mention the world economic forums global gender gap report and we should mention any of the data in the report
so by writing this we are going to highlight the gender equality that is prevailing all over the world coming to the first part of the question that is defining distinguishing all the three concepts so the definition of gender equality is like this the state of equal rights responsibilities and opportunities for all genders in the society so that constitutes the gender equality so first we should talk about the definition of the all the three concept coming to gender equity it is a fair treatment according to individual needs often addressing disadvantages then coming to the women's empowerment it is enabling women to gain control over their lives and make their own decisions then we should talk about the key focus of each of the three concept the key focus of the gender equalities it aims to treat men and women at par or it aims to treat men and women equally whereas the gender equality it recognizes the differences and adjusts the resources and supports them accordingly it means it takes into account the differences existed in terms of opportunities and resource allocation with respect to any gender if men are marginalized it gives importance to the men if women are marginalized then it gives importance to the women then coming to the key focus of women's empowerment the women empowerment it focuses on increasing the women's agency and uh, their decision making capacity so after writing the key focus we should uh, write the example so example for each of the three concept for gender equality the example is equal pay for equal work across the genders that is both for men women and transgenders and for gender equity example like paternity leaves and maternity leaves which needs the which addresses the different needs of mothers and fathers then coming to the example of women empowerment providing women access to education healthcare and employment opportunities so these are the examples so this is all about the first part of the answer now we have to talk about second part that is why it is important to take gender concerns into design program design and policy implementation so coming to the importance it promotes equality and social justice it promotes equality among different uh, genders like men women and transgenders in uh, providing equal opportunities in access to resources benefits and services then the second importance is targeted resource allocation so taking gender considerations into account while designing and programming policies helps in targeted resource allocation which are necessary for women empowerment so for example the micro finance schemes like self help group bank linkage it helps the government to fund the self help groups in order to empower women then the third point is it addresses specific needs and challenges the needs and challenges of a woman are different compared to men so with respect to education health and uh, employment so in order to address these specific needs and challenges it is important to take gender dimension while designing and implementation of the policies for example the narega workers have been provided crèche facilities in many of the grama panchayats in karnataka then the fourth importance is enhances the effectiveness of developmental programs that is programs that address gender concerns they are more likely to succeed because they reach the entire population rather than just one half of the population so by engaging both men and women in developmental efforts the programs can have broader and deeper impact for example the policies which are for example the agriculture policies if they have not taken into gender dimension into consideration then most of the policies are designed keeping in mind farmers as a only male farmers not the women farmers this hinders the effectiveness of the developmental programs which are aimed at empowering farmers in the last one decade in india what is happening feminization of agriculture is happening that means there are more number of female or women farmers more number of agricultural laborers are women so this trend is increasing in such a scenario the developmental policies which are aimed at farmers empowerment if they doesn't take into gender con, gender dimension into account then the effectiveness of the policies will decrease then the fifth point is 
it uh, ensures inclusivity and fairness gender sensitive programs they ensure that both men and women benefit equally from the developmental initiatives for example in the realm of healthcare addressing gender concerns may involve creating programs that target the maternal health and this ensures that the women have access to healthcare services for this we can write the schemes like pradhan mantri matru vayo vandana yojana this is all about the answer for second part of the question coming to the conclusion gender equality gender equity and women's empowerment are interconnected these are the interconnected concepts which are essential for creating a more inclusive and just society so by writing this we should we can conclude our answer or alternatively we should we, we can write that by promoting these principles we can work towards a world where all individuals regardless of their gender have equal rights opportunities and uh, the ability to thrive now we will discuss question number 9 and its answer approach coming to the question number 9 intercaste marriages between castes which have socio economic parity have increased to some extent but this is less true of interreligious marriages discuss so the question it has uh, two parts in the first part it is saying that the intercaste marriages between the caste which have socio economic parity it means the caste which are socio economically at the same level caste a and caste b both are socio economically at the same level then be, between such caste there is a increasing trend of intercaste marriages but the same is not true with respect to interreligious marriages so in the first part we should answer about why there is a growing trend of intercaste marriages between the caste which have a socio economic equality or socio economically they are equal and in the second part we should also talk about why they why it is not true with respect to interreligious marriages so the question is asking about discussion discuss so the uh, directive word is discuss so we have to talk about the multi dimensional aspects that is why interreligious marriages are not happening coming to the answer approach we have to begin our answer by writing an introduction so what we should write in the introduction so here we cannot define what is intercaste marriage or interreligious marriage instead of that we should quote a, any data related to intercaste marriage rise in intercaste marriage released by any of the agencies like india human development survey being conducted by national council for applied economic and research university of maryland so it comes up with the various uh, surveys on uh, surveys on various social aspects in india so it releases reports every now and then that is every year so in that report there will be statistics or data related to intercaste marriages and interreligious marriages that we can quote here as an introduction so after in writing introduction then we should answer the first part why there is a increasing intercaste marriages between caste which are socio economically equal so why there is a increasing trend of intercaste marriages among the castes which are socio economically at par so the first one is socio economic parity so because of this socio economic parity there is a gradual increase in the intercaste marriages especially among the castes which have a similar socio economic standing for instance the marriages between the upper middle class sections of different castes so here the major players are not the caste here the education profession and economic stability are important then the second factor is urbanization and education in urban settings where modern education and employment opportunities available it offers greater mobility and interaction across castes so the rigidity of caste boundary is weakening in urban structure so the educated individuals particularly women are more likely to choose partners based on their shared values or professional compatibility rather than caste then the third point that we can write is changing social perception that is uh, globalization and urbanization have contributed to the weakening of caste rigidities and caste barriers especially among financially secure and educated communities so this can be witnessed in cities like bengaluru where the it sector is dominant here we can witness the intercaste marriages between engineers and uh, professionals from different castes then the fourth point is 
legal and social support. So for this, we can mention the Special Marriages Act 1954. It provides couples with protection, allowing them to marry outside their caste without any religious ceremonies. This is all about the first part of the question. In the second part, we should address why inter-religious marriages are not increasing. So we should write the factors responsible for low number of inter-religious marriages. The first point is stronger social stigmas with respect to inter-religious marriages. So the inter-religious marriages, they face stronger opposition compared to the inter-caste marriages. Religion in India is India not just a personal belief, but it, is a, it has a strong social identity. And marrying outside one's religion often involves crossing not only the social, but also theological boundaries. So because of that, the inter-religious marriages, they face stronger opposition. The second point is conversion as a barrier, that is a religious conversion required by certain faiths for marriage, example in Islam, it acts as a significant barrier. This can lead to issues of acceptance and legal complexities. Then the third point is legal complexities. While the Special Marriage Act, it permits inter-religious marriages without conversion, the families may still pressurize the couples to marry according to religious customs. Then the fourth point is political and legal pressures. The religious polarization and vote bank politics, it creates uh, cultural tensions and uh, it uh, disturbs the communal harmony. So such instances, they hinder the chances of inter-religious marriages. So this is all about the second part of the question. So coming to the conclusion, so we should write in conclusion like inter-caste and inter-religious marriages in India are slowly becoming more accepted but they still face challenges and a resistance from the society. So these marriages are seen as a way to promote social equality and religious harmony in a diverse country like India. Or else alternatively we can write the gradual rise in inter-caste marriages is a positive indicator of evolving social dynamics, particularly in urban areas and among economically comparable groups. However, the challenges faced by inter-religious couples point to the need for broader social act acceptance and legal protections. Now we will discuss question number 10 and its answer approach. Coming to the question number 10, in dealing with socio-economic issues of development, what kind of collaboration between government, NGOs and private sector would be most productive? The question has single part. So it is asking about the collaboration between government, NGOs and private sector so that it will help in addressing the or dealing with the socio-economic issues of development. So the question is for 10 marks and the word limit is 150 words. We have to start our answer by writing introduction. So in the introduction, we should talk about socio-economic issues of development like socio-economic development encompasses addressing a wide range of issues such as poverty, unemployment, healthcare, education, gender equality and sustainable growth. So tackling these challenges requires coordinated efforts from governments, NGOs and private sector, each of which brings unique strengths and capacities. So this will become a good introduction. So here we are briefly introducing what is socio-economic issues of development and what is the importance of the collaboration between NGO, government and private sector. So after writing introduction, we should address the role of the government, NGO and private sector in development. First, we will talk about the role of the government. The major role of the government in addressing socio-economic issues of development are the first one is policy making and regulation. That is the government plays a central role in formulating policies, laws and regulations which are aimed at addressing socio-economic challenges. So the government has the authority to create an enabling environment for development through infrastructure, public service and welfare programs. So this is about the first point. Then the second point is resource allocation that is government it manages public finances allocates funds for developmental projects and invests in large-scale infrastructure projects such as transportation healthcare and education then the third point is welfare and social protection the government it provides direct assistance through social protection schemes such as subsidies pensions healthcare programs employment schemes like narega to combat poverty and inequality so this is the role of the government. Here we have briefly discussed the role of the government. Then we should uh, briefly discuss the role of the NGOs. The first point is 
NGOs have grassroots presence. NGOs have strong grassroots connections, allowing them to understand local needs and context better than large government institutions. So they can mobilize communities, ensure their participation and provide local solutions. Then the second point is advocacy and awareness. So NGOs, they often play a role in advocating for marginalized communities and raising awareness about key socio-economic issues such as education, gender rights, health, and environmental sustainability. Then the third point is capacity building. NGOs are involved in capacity building programs that empower local communities with skills and knowledge, making them self-sufficient and better equipped to handle their socio-economic challenges. So this is about the role of the NGO. Now we have to talk about the role of the private sector. So coming to the role of the private sector, the private sector, it is uh, famous or it is more involved in innovation and investment. This private sector brings expertise in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. Through corporate social responsibility initiatives, companies can contribute to the social welfare by investing in education, healthcare, sanitation and skill development. Then the second point is employment creation. The private sector is a significant contributor to employment generation and economic growth, which are critical components of socio-economic development. Then the third point is efficiency and accountability. With a focus on profitability and results, the private sector can bring efficiency, financial discipline and scalability to developmental initiatives, which can complement the more bureaucratic approaches of the government and NGOs. So this is about the role of the private sector and its importance. So after discussing the role of the, all the three, that is government, NGO and private sector, now we have to talk about the productive model, models of collaboration. So coming to the productive models of collaboration, first we are going to talk about public-private partnership model, that is PPP. So in public-private partnership model, it involves the collaboration between government and the private sector to execute the large-scale developmental projects. Particularly, it was dominant in economics infrastructure. Now it has it has come to the social infrastructure also. For this, we can give examples like Pradhan Mantri, Jana Aragya Yojana, Aishman Bharat. So coming to the benefits of PPMP model, it leverages the efficiency of the private sector and the regulatory power of the government, allowing large scale sustainable developmental projects that benefits both society and the country. Then secondly, we should then in the second, we should talk about the tri-sectoral collaboration, that is collaboration between government, NGO and private sector. So in the tri-sectoral collaboration, it brings the government, NGOs and the private sector to address the complex socio-economic issues, which require multifaceted solutions. Here, NGOs bring, brings the local knowledge, government provides funding and regulation, and the private sector offers innovation and scalability. For this, we can route, write the example like Swachh Bharat Mission. So coming to the benefits of uh, such a collaboration, that is tri-sectoral collaboration, it ensures that developmental initiatives are more holistic and sustainable, benefiting from the strength of each of the sector. Then the third model is corporate social responsibility programs. So in this uh, CSR programs, the private sector and NGOs are collaborating in order to ensure social welfare programs are reaching to the needy. So this is contributing to the socioeconomic development. So here the funding and implementing of projects is Funding is done by corporates and the implementation is being done by NGOs and civil societies. So for this, we can give examples like Tata Trust and Infosys Foundation. They are working on education, healthcare and rural development projects in collaboration with the local NGOs and the government initiatives. Then the fourth model is NGO-led development with government and private sector support. So in this model, the NGOs are taking the lead in designing and implementing the developmental projects uh, or programs, while the government and the private sector, they are providing financial and logistic support. For this, we can write an example like Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA. So this is all about the productive models of collaboration. Here we have discussed four models. That is more than enough. In the handout, there are other models which you can go through. Coming to the conclusion, a collaborative approach between the government, NGOs and the private sector is essential to tackle socio-economic challenges of development effectively. So by leveraging the strength of each of the sector, the collaboration can lead to sustainable, scalable and inclusive socio-economic development, ensuring that the 
benefit benefits of the growth reach all sections of society so by writing this we, we we can conclude our answer this is all about answer approach to the upsc 2024 mains gs1 paper question number 6 to question number 10 so this is part 2 video in the part 1 video we have discussed in the part 1 video we have discussed answer approach to the question number 1 to question number 5 in the part 3 video we are coming up with answer approach to the question number 11 to question number 15 thank you for watching see you in the next video till then happy answer writing